So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kamsawa Jantaviso. I am policy specialist with UN Women uh, uh, with the Ending Violence Against Women sections. Um, welcome everybody to our webinar series. Um, this is the second of the five series that we are organizing in partnership and collaboration with the Prevention Collaborative. Um, we are exploring uh, different topics uh, for entry points on how to do prevention work in a different setting and in connection with different topics. And today we will be looking specifically on prevention work in the humanitarian setting or humanitarian and crisis context. I think you, we have learned throughout the pandemic and after the pandemic, um, you know, context change uh, can change rapidly. Uh, from development to crisis to um, managing an emergency, but also um, contact chains from crisis to recovery can happen soon as well. But uh, we would like to explore today how that affect our prevention work when context change and what it means to work specifically in, in unstable context in, in, a, in a setting where different institutional um, services um, and, 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 and norms are not uh, uh, dis disrupted um, and how to uh, prevent violence when there are new different risk factors introduced to the context um, and how to, to, to continue the work on prevention. And today we, we are lucky to have an expert uh, to guide us through this um, for, with us for uh, about 90 minutes. So the webinar is recorded, so hopefully it's okay with all the participants. We are going to start with the, the presentations from the expert Maureen Murphy, and then we would leave um, uh, about 30 minutes at the end for, for Q&A. There, there is a Q&A function, so I encourage um, participants to um, share ideas and also share the questions. So without further ado, uh, allow me to introduce you to, to our speaker today, Maureen Murphy, who is a research scientist with the Global Women's Institute um, at the George Washington University, where she focuses on research and m and for GBV in humanitarian setting. Previously, she has worked with numerous international non-governmental and non-profit organizations, including in South Sudan with the American Refugee Committee and also in Sierra Leone with Go Island. Uh, prior to this, she works with the child protection, with the child protection in crisis network based at Columbia University to coordinate locally driven child protection and gender-based violence research project in Africa and Asia. Welcome, Maureen, um, and we're looking forward to hearing your expertise and your experience. Um, so over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and I'm really excited to see such interest in this topic. Um, the prevention of violence against women and girls in humanitarian settings is, I would say, a very complex and nuanced issue, so we will talk about as much as we can over the course of about the next hour. Um, and I really look forward to uh, answering some questions at the end. Um, so just to start us off, we're actually just going to have a quick poll to see who is in the room. So if we can launch that and we're just going to give everybody about one to two minutes to uh, answer just these two simple questions. So we know where we are and a little bit about our experience levels. And Johanna, I think you can, once we feel you have enough responses, you can close it for us so we have a sense. Wonderful. So, wow, we have such a great distribution of geographical regions. I, I tried to be uh, large in some of these, but I can see some great uh, participation, particularly from Asia Pacific and Africa, who are, I think are our winners, but also great participation from all around the world. So thank you for that, no matter your time zone, joining us for this wonderful discussion. Um, and it's also really helpful to have a sense of how um, much time that we have 
actually worked on GBV issues. Um, and I particularly appreciate that 12% that have never worked on this topic in humanitarian settings. Um, we really are excited that you're joining us um, and we hope that you'll learn a lot from this session, um, but we hope that everybody from those that have 10 years plus um, to none uh, gets something out of our discussion today. So welcome to all. Just to briefly uh, give the overview of where we're going to go today, uh, our first section is just going to be talking a little bit about gender-based violence in humanitarian action. Um, just to make sure that we're all starting from the same page, um, we won't go into huge detail given the time, but just sort of reflecting on some of the policies and framework that um, underpins the, the work around gender-based violence prevention in humanitarian action. We're then going to talk a little bit about kind of that acute emergency phase, really focusing down on the issue of risk mitigation, which is different from prevention that we're going to talk about, but really a key approach in humanitarian action. Um, and then finally, we're going to move into that kind of longer term prevention space. I think sometimes what people think of when they think of GBV prevention um, and still does happen in humanitarian action, um, but often maybe more in the protracted crisis phase or often into post-conflict. So we'll touch upon some of the potential programming approaches that can be used and that have good evidence um, in that space. So just to start us off, we need to be thinking about ourselves as humanitarian actors when we come into an emergency. Um, as humanitarian staff, we bring in resources to the community. We have power and we need to recognize that. And I think that that is one of the key things we can do when thinking about GBV prevention is understanding that we are also actors that are coming into space and can make things better, make things worse, or maintain the status quo when it comes to gender-based violence. Um, our interventions can help actually loosen restrictions that hold back women and girls who are half a community, even more often in a displaced community where men maybe are still um, associated with the conflict um, and women and children are coming to a refugee camp or an internally displaced person site. Um, and our interventions really have the ability to affect women and girls. So slightly a little bit um, fuzzy here, but you can get the sense of looking at just this very simple visual representation of gender power balance in a humanitarian crisis. We all live in inequitable societies. I'm based here in the United States. It is certainly an agenda and equitable society. Um, and many of you come from societies that have varying levels of gender equality. Humanitarian crises happen in all of these settings. It's important to recognize that. And typically what we mean when we look at this is we think about maybe on, on a boat, right? We have men who are up on the, the side of the boat that are farther away from the water, from the hazard. And women are often closer to that hazard because of just the gender inequitable norms, the lack of ability to access resources, education, have power to own land, to own assets. All of these issues affect the, the gender power balance even before a crisis hits. Ideally, what we want is our healthy balance boat. We want men and women to have equal power and for our boat to be stable. That's what we're always looking for when we're thinking about a GBV prevention program in any context. But as a humanitarian aid worker, when we come into our setting, uh, we often find that um, our assistants can maintain that status quo. So we can come in, we can kind of be gender blind, we can just do our work and not consider gender throughout, and basically our gender power balance can just remain the same. But we can also exaggerate the impact. What we actually can do as humanitarian professionals is that when we bring in 
uh, additional aid resources, when we come in with our power in these settings, we can actually make women and girls at further risk of GBV. Um, this happens all of the time when we don't think about gender in our programs. Um, it's very easy to do. We're thinking it's an emergency situation. We need to get life-saving aid into the hands of the population. I mean, I think we can think about the earthquake right now in Turkey and Syria. And, you know, that initial just rush to need to help people. Um, and we forget to consider gender in our design of our programs. And and whether that's giving a cash transfer to a male head of household, um, which could potentially help the household in meeting its basic needs, but could also potentially increase violence within the home. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't give emergency cash transfers, but we should be thinking about the mechanisms through which we do it and trying to mitigate the risk of GBV through our program interventions. So what we want, what we would like to do is we would like to see our assistance as humanitarian aid workers try to reduce that power inequality, actually bring women up on the boat so that they're farther away from the water hazards. And we can do that. And that is honestly what a lot of gender-based violence, risk mitigation and prevention work is in an acute emergency. It's really trying to just help to reduce those power imbalances in as simple ways as we can, trying to use the power that we're bringing into our communities to try to right that ship. Um, and it might not be completely equal in the end, but even bringing women up so that they're a bit farther away from the hazard um, is really impactful and can really be the difference of the woman falling into the water in our metaphor here. Um, or being being able to stay on the boat. So we just want to keep this in mind as we're thinking about uh, preventing violence um, and mitigating risk throughout humanitarian action. Just some other key foundational points that whenever we talk about GBB prevention, I do want to highlight and make sure is always at the top of our minds. The first is we always need to assume that GBV is occurring. We know it's occurring in um, non-conflict situations, non-humanitarian crises. We know it's happening here in the United States. We know it's happening all around the world. And the WHO has excellent estimates on the amount of violence that's occurring uh, throughout all of the WHO regions um, and in many specific countries as well. So when we are thinking about humanitarian action, one of the most important things is we don't need to prove that GBV is occurring. We don't need to suddenly go into an emergency situation. Again, let's think of Turkey um, and Syria as, a, as an excellent example that's happening right now. It's in no one's interest. It's in not in the women and girls' interest, not in the aid workers' interest to suddenly need to go and collect population level data to demonstrate that GBV is occurring in this population. There's been a lot of education with donors over the last few decades, um, and really the humanitarian community is in agreement that it is not appropriate to collect population data to demonstrate prevalence of GBV in an emergency situation. Sometimes it can be helpful at a later stage if it's helpful to your program, if it's helpful to an advocacy point. There are certainly moments that it can happen, but it is definitely not uh, the first priority in an emergency situation, even when you're thinking about GBV prevention. And that's where it does differ a little bit from some other forms of humanitarian aid, where we often want to establish some kind of prevalence, like a nutrition program. We might want to know the prevalence of severe acute malnutrition as a starting point for a nutrition program. For a GBV program, typically we don't want to put women and girls and men and boys who can also, of course, be survivors. We don't want to put them through that re-traumatization um, and we don't need that data uh, as a starting point to start implementing programs. 
I also just want to highlight that it's it's not just us being a good person, you know, wanting to do a gender-based violence program in a humanitarian emergency. These are part of the humanitarian obligations, um, protection, of course, being a core principle. I won't go through all of these, but I just to highlight, uh, you know, a few where we have the UN Security Council resolutions, uh, humanitarian principles, often gender-based violence is uh, illegal under national law and certainly international law. Uh, we also have humanitarian standards and guidance, um, and these are all some of the quite of core underlying guidance and, and principles that lead us to know that we as humanitarian actors have to work together to prevent and mitigate GBV. Just a few of the very specific ones, which I won't go into huge detail about for time, and I'm sure you probably know about many of them, but just again to re-emphasize that this is an essential component of a life-saving humanitarian aid. Of course, the entirety of the Women, Peace, and Security agenda, um, which specifically looks generally at conflict-related sexual violence, which is one form of GBV that happens in an emergency. Um, and similarly, the Rome Statute of the ICC, which establishes sexual violence as a war crime. Uh, sexual violence is also a grave violation against children during conflict. Um, so again, you know, really emphasizing the importance of ensuring that we focus on gender-based violence in emergencies. Um, but there's also wider pieces of legislation, uh, looking at the international human rights treaties, and particularly CEDAW, um, which is still applicable in humanitarian emergencies to try to reduce their, the uh, all forms of discrimination against women and girls. We also have some specialist documentation that's really focused on uh, trying to give best practice and guidance to, uh, to practitioners in humanitarian action. So you know, if you're new to this field, that 12% that haven't worked in this field before, looking up some of these documents and understanding some of the key pieces that are important and really underpin the humanitarian response. I'll highlight the GBV Call to Action, which is an initiative of governments um, and NGOs and international organizations and women's rights organizations, which basically kind of comes together and tries to prioritize, try to lay out a roadmap uh, to preventing gender-based violence in humanitarian settings, focusing specifically on first establishing GBV specialized services. And I emphasize this, um, no prevention or risk mitigation program can exist in a, in a vacuum. So while we're not focusing on GPV response in this specific webinar, um, establishing response services is a key precursor to being able to do robust uh, GBV and risk mitigation work. So um, certainly establishing those are incredibly important uh, at the first phase of an emergency and making sure that they're adequately funded um, is essential because whenever we're doing gender-based violence work, whether that's you know, doing a large prevention program or trying to mitigate risks. If we uncover a case of violence, we want to be able to link that person to services. We want to have a strong and robust referral pathway that allows them to get all the needed care. Um, and of course, the call to action highlights that. Um, and it also highlights the different actions that we can take to prevent and mitigate GBV risks throughout uh, all phases of the humanitarian uh, program response. And finally talks about these longer term initiatives, such as, you know, mainstreaming gender equality, um, the empowerment of women and girls throughout humanitarian action, which are also just key principles. We also have 
other key frameworks and resources. Again, this is just a quick overview. There are also more out there. Um, but of course, you know, the sustainable development goals, again, um, are important for us to be thinking about here. We are still trying to get to um, sustainable development goal number five, uh, achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls. Um, so particularly as we're moving to protracted crisis and post-conflict settings, ensuring that we we keep that in mind specific to the humanitarian space um the grand bargain which is a important sort of work stream that's trying to ensure quality funding but also is really concerned with the idea of localization um trying to make sure that humanitarian action is led by delivered by um, and ensures the capacity of local responders and the participation of affected communities in addressing humanitarian needs. And I really emphasize this because particularly when we get to GBV prevention work, the leadership of local communities is so essential. There's often um, a view and somewhat true that GBV prevention programming is pushing against and challenging existing cultural and gender norms in a society. Um, because it often is, because most of our societies are patriarchal. And in order to change that, there needs to be a push against the norm. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of leadership from the local level uh, for these efforts. It really doesn't help to have the international community come in um, and do this on their own, because then it's very much felt as it's an other thing. Um, and it doesn't feel like it's driven by the local community, it's not owned by them, and it can experience much larger pushback than if we're supporting organic efforts to change gender norms that are led by, designed, and implemented by local organizations. So, you know, we'll talk about that kind of throughout, but I really want to emphasize it as a key principle for considering GBV prevention in a humanitarian space. Um, and we also just have some other kind of important guidance. Of course, the sphere standards talk about GBV um, and ensuring that we uh, are meeting them as the minimum uh, requirements in a humanitarian space. And importantly, uh, there's the interagency minimum standards for GBV in emergencies programming. So this is, again, a great resource and tool. Um, it goes through the priorities when it comes to risk mitigation and GBV prevention, um, and is really just sort of a nice kind of Bible for you um, if you're interested in this space. So I really recommend taking a look. And just to kind of wrap this part up, all of these aspects, thinking about the policy environment, thinking about participation, thinking about coordinated actions, um, we often have things like national action plans, which are a great entry point for um, many different agencies to start engaging around issues around gender-based violence. We often have national action plans uh, related to GBV, and then we also often do for women, peace, and security, um, which which sometimes can have some overlap, uh, particularly when it comes to the sexual violence space. So ensuring that these are robust and well-resourced um, and are community-driven, driven by the actual needs of GBV uh, humanitarian uh, response and prevention actors on the ground, ensuring all of our programs are designed to be accountable to women and girls um, is essential reducing impunity of uh, perpetrators. We're not going to go into a lot of the, the details, <clears throat> excuse me, of um, the legal efforts on the ground, because that often tends to be a bit more of a governmental space. Um, but trying to reduce impunity uh, is obviously an essential component for prevention and risk mitigation. Um, and just ensuring, again, that gender equality and support to women's rights and participation are, are key aspects of any type of risk mitigation and prevention program that we do.
so I've been throwing around these terms um, and maybe that maybe you know them well or maybe you're confused by them so I wanted to just pause here before we get into more of the detail on them and just define what I mean when I say GBV risk mitigation or GBV prevention. Because if you're not familiar with the humanitarian space, you might just assume that they are the same thing because obviously mitigating risks of GBV can lead to preventing it. But they are, in, in our practical terms, um, quite different. And they, re they refer to different streams of programming. So risk mitigation is really reducing the risk of exposure to GBV. And typically, these are actions that oftentimes are a little bit more um, short term. They're quicker, um, for example, establishing sufficient lighting um, and security patrols are in place in like a displacement camp placing locks on the inside of latrines. These are two very simple examples, um, but they are trying to reduce that risk of exposure. While prevention often is conceptualized as slightly longer term programming, and it's taking action to stop GBV from first occurring. Um, and these are often these longer term programs that are things like scaling up activities that promote gender equality, working with communities to address practices that contribute to GBV. So we're going to take these in, in steps um, and start with our risk mitigation and then move to the longer term prevention activities. But I think it's important to remember that they both feed into this larger goal of reducing GBV. Um, and they both are important considerations when we think about what GBV prevention programming looks like in humanitarian settings. So uh, again, our, our first entry point to this will be looking at GBV risk mitigation. And I've put here acute emergency or acute um, just to sort of really re-emphasize that this is something that should be immediately started in an acute emergency phase. It should still continue throughout a response, but, but really when we're thinking about, you know, one of the first priorities when it comes to thinking about the prevention side of work in a humanitarian crisis is thinking about risk mitigation. So I'm just going to pause for one minute and you can think in your head, what are some risk factors for GBV you may ex expect to see in a humanitarian crisis? So just for, for one minute, for 30 seconds, think about what are some of the potential risk factors that you might expect? So I don't know if you've thought of any of these, but some of the reasons, and this is not an exhaustive list, but some of the risk factors, some of the reasons why GBV is considered such a priority in an emergency situation is in some cases, there are new threats or forms of GBV related to conflict. Um, so we think in particular when it comes to things like conflict-related sexual violence. Sexual violence occurs in all societies around the world, but the specific experience of conflict-related sexual violence is often new, um, where women and girls might be targeted for uh, specific uh, acts of violence um, in order to try to shame an enemy, to reduce their reproductive capacity, to make them, you know, feel like they cannot protect their own communities for a litany of different reasons. Um, and this is certainly you know, one of the sort of highest profile forms of GBV that we often see in an emergency. But that being said, we often see a lot of other forms or other risk factors for GBV that exist in any society around the world, um, they are exacerbated during an emergency situation. So oftentimes there's increased vulnerability and dependence. 
you know, if, if thinking about Turkey and Syria, again, people have lost their homes, they've lost their means of work, they've lost, you know, any ability to access their, their savings, they've lost the basics that allow us to survive in, in any society. Um, and this increases the potential for exploitation. We always know that people can come into these situations um, and can try to exploit people who are now newly vulnerable. Also, just things like lack of privacy. Um, if you're having to move into a displaced persons camp or a refugee camp, you know, oftentimes you suddenly don't have any privacy. There's overcrowding. There's multiple people being put into a, a flat or an apartment or a house um, because there's not enough. Uh, a lack of safe access to basic needs, uh, separation from family, um, or that traditional support structure. If you're suddenly on your own, those traditional structures that might have kept you safe. You know, if my if my husband and I are having you know a disagreement and it turns violent, I can run to my family and my parents will have a talk and we'll try to mitigate the situation. It might not be the ideal outcome, but it was a safety strategy that that I could use when things got bad. And now I don't have anywhere to go. I don't have that sort of normal support structure anymore. Um, lack of documentation and registration discrimination. Um, you know, we certainly when we do a lot of work in, in refugee settlements, the issue of the ration card is a huge issue. Who's on the ration card? If a family suddenly separates, who gets that ration card? What is the process for ensuring um, both the men and the women on the card are still have access to food rations if the household separates? And how long does that take in, in, our, bureaucr in our bureaucratic situa or situations? Um, just the breakdown of these pr protective social mechanisms and norms regulating behavior. That increase of guns, of violence, of, of societal norms breaking down that kept things, again, maybe not perfect, but could be protective for women and girls. Um, oftentimes, these can break down. And these are just a few of the reasons that we often really do see a spike in GBV in an emergency situation. This is just a very short visual um, about some of the intersections of conflict in GBV and uh, don't have to worry about it too much. The key thing to think about is that there are some forms of GBV that are directly related to conflict. So for example, our, our example of conflict related sexual violence, um, killing of, of women and girls specifically because of their gender, abduction. There are certain pieces that are really, really closely tied to conflict when we're thinking about situations of conflict. Um, but there are also many indirectly related uh, forms of violence that, again, are exacerbated by the conditions, um, whether it's a conflict experience or displacement related to a natural disaster, that can ensure that these forms of violence are also increasing. And what I really do want to highlight is the idea, it says here IPV, which is an acronym for intimate partner violence. Um, oftentimes, colloquially, you know, we would say domestic violence. Um, so we like to be very specific in our terms and say intimate partner. So specifically talking about, about um, a husband and wife, a boyfriend and girlfriend, also could be same sex relationships, boyfriend and boyfriend, girlfriend and girlfriend. Um, but the idea of an intimate partner perpetrating violence against another. Um, and I think it's really important to note that there's been a lot of research in recent years that has really delineated the connection and really shown that not only sexual violence increases during times of conflict, but a lot of these more indirect risk factors, these indirect drivers of violence can really affect forms of violence that were traditionally seen as, you know, pre-existing or not conflict related. They were just seen as things that happen. 
But what research has really shown in now a number of contexts is that people who are exposed to these emergency situations um, oftentimes experience more of other forms of GBV, including intimate partner violence, other forms of family violence, um, could be increases in other kinds of patriarchal practices. Trafficking is another one that is, really does increase often um, in an emergency situation. And so when we're thinking about risk mitigation and prevention, we need to be thinking about GBV holistically um, and not just thinking about sexual violence. So that's really one of the things I wanted to, to highlight in this session. Um, sexual violence is important and we obviously need to address it, but it's not the only issue affecting women and girls. And in fact, is, is not affecting as many compared to the multitude of other forms of GBV. So moving into some of the practicalities, when I say risk mitigation, what do I mean? Um, how do I know what risks are out there? So the first step typically is that we're going to do some kind of risk assessment in an emergency. Um, oftentimes, you know, that is a multi-organizational effort, um, you know, going and collecting data um, through kind of key informant interviews, observations, secondary data review, et cetera. Also doing gender analyses. Um, I think that's a key tool in our toolbox to make sure that we are addressing gender. Um, and I'll show an example of that in one second. Um, but also we have things like safety audits and risk mapping which are efforts where we actually go and talk to women and girls, talk to the affected populations and see, well, what risks are you experiencing? I put this example here because it's kind of, you can see it a little bit better because it's a school-based example. Um, but, you know, you can see some of the safety risks that were identified by boys and girls. Some of them are very physical, like there's no doors, there's no windows on the school. Um, and then there's some more social, like the teacher is touching the girl's skirt. So this is an issue that's occurring in this school. And it's a way to actually map out some of the risks that women and girls are experiencing. Um, and then making sure that we can create plans to directly reduce those risks. Another example of gender analysis. Um, so again, I won't go into detail. This is an example from CARE, which I just thought was a nice visual representation. You can do gender analyses in many different ways. It's a very sort of simple representation. But what I liked about it is that it was really in a simple way showing some of the issues in, in, in Syria. You know, we have the breakdown in the population. But when we're thinking about gender analysis, it's important to be remembering that there's a lot of intersecting risk factors. So here they've broken down also the population by age, and they've looked at the disability level, um, as well as looking at things like women's voice and leadership, gender-based violence levels, education. So looking at all of these different pieces and thinking about how that then would inform our programming. So a, a kind of a key bit in our, in our toolbox is thinking about gender throughout our assessments, throughout out our analysis um, and making sure that we design programs that are ready um, and able to address gender throughout. Just briefly, um, what are some of the GBV risk factors for the following sectors? Um, I'll give you again 30 seconds to, in your head to be thinking about, you know, one or two risk factors that you might think about. I think one of the important things to note when we're thinking about GBV risk mitigation is that it is the responsibility of all humanitarian actors. So you do not need to be a GBV specialist. In fact, uh, it's not really the role of the GBV specialist to be thinking about risk mitigation. They're often thinking about response. They're often thinking about these longer term prevention programs. It's everyone in everyone's sector, whether you're in health or water sanitation or shelter, food distribution, livelihoods, you should be thinking about what risks that women and girls might experience and how you might mitigate them. So 
there's a lovely guideline for this, um, which is, again, is really useful. And certainly in this short session, we're not going to go through it all, but really it is a useful reference because it really is sort of sector specific. Um, and then you can go and you can look at whatever type of programming that you're uh, intervening in um, or supporting programs for and try to make sure that we are actually mitigating risk throughout. Um, just an example, um, these are from the guidelines. So thinking about water sanitation and hygiene, um, some of the key questions. So as you're thinking about your analysis phase, even thinking about your gender analysis, thinking about the different things, you know, and simple, simple questions, like what are the preferences and cultural habits to consider before determining the types of toilets, bathing facilities, laundries, kitchens, and water points to be constructed? There's a litany of bad programming examples over the last many decades, where again, the humanitarian community comes in and creates completely inappropriate in infrastructure for that population, um, and particularly women and girls girls feel unsafe or not able to use them because they're culturally inappropriate or they're being built in a in a space that's not safe um, or that they where they don't feel safe going um, so it's wasting a lot of money in humanitarian response um, and it's really sort of affecting the quality also thinking about again that idea of just safety are the facilities that we're putting in are they secure do they have lighting, privacy, locks, et cetera? Again, this is not complex programming. This is meant to be things that we're thinking about in an acute emergency that make sure that we're actually delivering good programming that meets the needs of half the population, women and girls, um, who are often, again, overlooked. When we go into an emergency situation, we meet the community leader, we put the water point where they say to put it, because it's an emergency. And rather than thinking, maybe if we just took 30 more minutes and just also spoke to the women leaders and found out where they would think it would be safe to, to put this. It's a small investment and it leads to much better outcomes and much better programming. So when we think about risk mitigation, these are the kind of core things that we think about. Um, yeah, you can see again, examples there. Another example, um, and this is obviously a very popular program these days, um, and this is a little bit moving away from, from the emergency guidance and just sort of showing what some of the evidence shows. Um, emergency cash transfers are a really important tool in our toolbox, particularly in acute emergencies. Um, and generally what the evidence shows is that they can have mixed impacts when we think about uh, sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. Um, and intimate partner violence. There was one literature review that looked at 28 studies uh, looking at the use of cash transfers uh, in humanitarian settings, and they found that 80% of the reviewed studies had some kind of self-reported positive effect on IPV, and that's not necessarily IPV prevalence. It could be, you know, less arguing, et cetera, um, but they generally found sort of positive self-reported uh, findings. However, if we're thinking about this from kind of a researcher's perspective, you know, most of those studies were, were probably not that high of quality. They weren't impact evaluations, um, and that kind of limits our overall conclusions that we can draw from that. Um, there was one impact evaluation that was included in that uh, overview, and it found that cash assistance didn't affect child marriage, which was the outcome that was being assessed. So again, you know, some evidence to show that, that it can reduce violence or reduce tension in the household, but it's still a little bit of a question. I think one of the, the newer studies that have come out over the last few years um, was looking at a cash transfer in Syria um, and found that emergency short-term three-month unconditional cash transfer that was targeted at the heads of household regardless of sex 
Um, there was no control group in this. So if we're thinking about, again, our levels of evidence rigor, you know, it's, it's sort of a middle one, but it did have pre and post data. So it had data before they received the cash transfer and then after. Um, women reported increased food security and then reduced negative coping strategies, um, which were both very important. However, married women did increase, uh, report increased intimate partner violence. And because of the design of this project, I mean, we cannot conclude that the cash transfer caused this increase, but it does continue to raise concerns about the need for adequate protection mechanisms and thinking about how we structure cash transfers. Would this be different if we had given it to the woman? I don't know the answer to that, but it's thinking about how, again, when we're thinking about our boat, what is our intervention doing? You know, is it increasing risk? Is it reducing risk? Is it maintaining the status quo? Um, so as we're thinking about and moving towards a much more cash-based humanitarian response, um, it's important to always consider gender and honestly, at minimum, just including questions in our post-distribution monitoring um, that might not ask these specific questions because there can be ethical concerns about asking um, about specific experiences of violence in a questionnaire. But asking in general about safety, asking about unintended consequences, monitoring this, and trying to make sure that our, our programs are responsive um, to potentially increased risks of violence that can occur. Um, one great example that I'll just highlight here of um, a program called Empowered Aid which is a participatory action research program. And it's specifically looking at sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. Um, but this was an effort was, which was really trying to work with women and girls to identify the risks that they were experiencing in humanitarian action and working with them to identify potential mitigation strategies. So, you know, this included very simple things like having men and women separate separated into different lines when they were receiving food distributions this is in Uganda. Um, so again, a lot of risk mitigation strategies are not, I would not rocket science. There are things that we can do that are achievable, that don't have to be high cost, but they are really important um, that we ensure the participation of women and girls throughout the process, because the risks that they're experiencing from their perspective might be different than the ones that we assume as outsiders. And they often have really good suggestions that, you know, can be simply implemented in order to raise their feelings of safety. Um, and while this project was specifically looking at uh, SIA, these types of interventions could certainly look at many different forms of GBV. So just kind of in conclusion, thinking about risk mitigation, we need to be thinking about it in the program design phase, the implementation phase, and also thinking about it through our routine M&E. It's super important that we track this information, whether that's just looking at our impact uh, of our programming with gender sensitive indicators, um, looking at sex disaggregated data, I know it again sounds simple, but you would be really surprised at the amount of humanitarian programming that still is not able to achieve some of these real basics when it comes to, to looking at GBV. So I'm going to pause for one minute and I'm going to ask Johanna to, to put poll number two up. This is just a knowledge check. One simple question. So we'll give you 30 seconds. Uh, but who has the primary responsibility to mitigate GBV risks? Johanna, do we think we have enough to close? Great. See, again, 96% of you, the primary responsibility is all humanitarians, right? This is one of the key points when we're thinking about GBV risk mitigation. It's everybody's job. It's not the GBV specialist's job to make sure risks are mitigated. So I'm really happy that that has come across.
So now um, we're going to move more towards the idea of longer term prevention. So I put it here as kind of the protracted crisis phase. In general, we're probably not doing a lot of longer term GBV prevention in acute emergencies. Um, it's just generally not possible. Um, often these programs, you know, are trying to delve into deeper issues around, you know, gender equality, uh, gender norms power, um, and they it tends to fit better in the protracted crisis uh, phase, as well as moving into post-conflict. I do think it's important to reference that you can do GBV prevention action in humanitarian settings. Um, I often think that we get kind of this pushback that it's just not possible. But when we think of an emergency situation, um, I think, you know, I'm trying to remember the last UNHCR um, statistics, but I believe the, the um, average length of a refugee is something like 20 to 25 years, you know, in displacement. So when we're talking about GBV prevention, we're probably not talking about that first six months, that first maybe, you know, acute phase of an emergency. But oftentimes situations stabilize quite dramatically. People are in camps. Camps are actually a really useful place to do some of this prevention work. People are together. They are, you know, in their, their, you know, maybe, maybe if they're coming from a rural area, that's often very displaced. Now they're suddenly coming together in, you know, this more, um, congested area. We know GBV risks are increasing, so the importance of doing prevention work is also increased. Um, and people sometimes maybe even have more time um, because they're not necessarily working. Um, so there's a lot of different considerations to be thinking about when we're thinking about GBV prevention, but, but typically when we're thinking about it in an emergency, we're thinking about it in that protracted stage. When we think about what people would call GBV prevention programming in humanitarian settings, um, oftentimes, historically, you know, it was really small in scope. Um, people love to do a GBV prevention and response program, which is response, developing very good response services, and doing awareness raising and thinking that that is prevention. Awareness raising is great. It is a useful tool in your bucket, can help a lot of things. It is not the same thing as a prevention program. Prevention programming you know, takes a lot more skill. If increasing awareness, you know, helped us change behavior, um, you know, fully, we would be a much better society because I think all of us are aware, you know, of um, think of COVID-19, right? We are all aware that to reduce transmission, you no, know, we should wear a mask in society. Um, I'm sure I go out my door in Washington, D.C. I'm sure you go out your door in wherever setting you are in and you're not seeing a lot of people wearing a mask despite the fact that there's a pandemic. So being aware of something does not necessarily lead to a behavior change. It's important. It's, it's helpful. If I wasn't aware I was supposed to wear a mask at all, then, you know, it would be even more shape, but it shouldn't necessarily be equated with a prevention program. We often find that a lot of our programming um, in these settings really focuses on rape. Again, sexual violence being kind of considered that new form of violence in a conflict. Um, but again, as we've mentioned, you know, really what we found and what the evidence found is that, you know, a vast majority of women and girls in many emergency situations are being affected by many other forms of gender-based violence, um, including intimate partner violence. Um, a lot of these programs are very vertical. So it's a GBV program that's on its own. It's it's not associated with anything else um, short term, which will remain somewhat of an issue in all emergency situations. We're all aware that short term funding cycles are the bane of prevention programming, whether you're in a development setting or whether you're in an emergency situation, but certainly funding cycles for an emergency tend to be a lot shorter, sometimes as little as six months. Um, so thinking about what you can do around prevention with that really short term uh, programming cycle 
we've seen some really great advantages or um, achievements in recent years from donors that are really recognizing this and really trying to extend grant periods where possible. So I know it's still a work in progress, but we are, are seeing sort of movement on this um, internationally. And hopefully we'll see more donors trying to actually build in longer term uh, programming cycles, even for emergency programs. Um, and of course, we all know that humanitarian appeals are grossly underfunded. GBV in particular is one of the most underfunded of the clusters. Um, and so we often have very limited budget that we can use to actually implement these programs. Also, again, these programs traditionally often don't actually take into account those root causes of GBV. Um, they don't take uh, into account power differentials, gender inequality, lack of respect for human rights. Um, and as I said, stops really at awareness raising and risk mitigation. Um, I would say prevention activities that target changes in social norms and power dynamics are still relatively rare. There are a lot of NGOs doing good work on this now, um, but I would still say that they tend to be the minority. Um, and we need more attention to these, particularly in these protracted crisis and displacement settings. So. I'm just going to go over a few approaches that have some evidence behind them. They're not 100, they're not all of the potential approaches that you could use, um, but there's some of them that people are doing good work on, and they have actually built in some good evaluative mechanisms. So we can say that, you know, they're having some impact. The first being thinking about transforming social norms, gender norms, um, using social mobilization approaches. So again, this is targeting the whole of community. Um, if we think in the more development settings, we think of something like ASASA. We think of something that's really trying to look at the, as a community, as the end product, not the individual, and trying to change attitudes, norms, and actually reducing the use of violence through this process. Just a, a quick example that does have some evidence behind it, which was designed by UNICEF and evaluated by Johns Hopkins, is uh, the Community Cares Program, um, which was piloted in Somalia and South Sudan. Again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, all good prevention programming also should ensure access to quality response services. So there was a, an effort through this program to strengthen the community care for survivors. Um, but there was also a program that was trying to you know, engage community members in a collective reflection and exploration of values, aspirations, and norms you know, exploring alternatives to violence and committing to take concrete actions. Um, so this program, again, it was using that community-based approach to really try to change gender norms. I mean, it did have some success in um, improving attitudes and changing norms within the community, which we know is a precursor to reducing violence. Um, another example that I wanted to highlight, because this is everyone's always question, is um, how do we better engage men? Um, and this is an important thing. Um, the best community-based programs to reduce violence obviously involve men. Um, women generally don't commit violence um, against other, you know, against their partners unless it's in retaliation. I mean, obviously that's not 100% true. Some women might instigate violence, but if we look at the numbers, the vast majority are male instigated incidents of conflict. Um, so we absolutely need to engage men in prevention activities by, by just excluding them and only concentrating on women. Um, it's really challenging to prevent violence. So again, a good example of this, um, it's the EMOP program developed by IRC, um, which is engaging men through accountable practice so there, in, in this specific example um, that they were piloting, they had male-only discussion groups, uh, which were aimed to try to prevent IPV, to transform gender attitudes and couple couples power dynamics. Um, and then there was an effort to try to make sure that the discussion groups were informed by and still accountable to women's groups in the community. 
overall, the evaluation found um, that there was an improvement in the quality of the couple's relationships, um, and this actually reduced some male behaviors that are often associated with IPV, so like reducing alcohol consumption. There was an improvement in gender equitable attitudes, uh, reducing their support for violence against women, and increasing their support for a woman's right to refuse to have sex. However, the female partners of male EMAP participants reported, on average, no change in the levels of IPV that they experienced. So, you know, there potentially there could be some promise in this program, but at this stage of that evaluation, they weren't really finding reductions in IPV. And in general, when we're thinking about evidence um, developed for uh, violence against women for GBV programming, we would typically bias ourselves towards the, the response of the woman because we would feel that she would typically be more honest because the men, of course, have now gone through this programming and might now know to say, oh, yes, I don't use as much violence, um, but the women are, are more likely to actually, you know, give the facts about what they're experiencing. So, you know, potential promise, but, but not there yet. Um, another example, thinking about it a little bit more um, in a, a a little bit more confined manner is thinking about how we actually promote positive masculinities within the security sector. Um, so an example of this is um, a living, the Living Peace Program, um, which was evaluated by was, was then Promundo, is now Equimundo. Um, and that's integrating training curricula into the police and defense force in the DRC. Um, so these were group sessions to promote new positive norms of masculinities in families and communities. Um, and the evaluation found a decrease in the purported use of violence, including physical violence. So again, it's thinking about some of these same concepts of positive masculinities, of changing norms, of changing our understanding of what it means to be a man. And and sort of working with a very specific group of police and defense forces. Um, and it did find, again, some success. Another a program approach to be thinking about that we often use is the idea of economic empowerment and livelihoods. Um, certainly, these have the potential when we see them in development settings, they can reduce uh, intimate partner violence in particular. Um, and when we look specifically in conflict related or humanitarian settings, we find a little bit of a mixed bag. Some programs have been seen to actually prevent violence, particularly IPV, um, while others either had no effect or had an increased risk, particularly when there was no sort of plus component. And we say, when we say plus, um, particularly thinking often about cash and programs that include cash transfers, the plus part of it is including some kind of component uh, of gender norms or power dynamics, trainings, interventions. So it's moving beyond like what the Syria example was in um, the acute emergency phase and trying to associate some behavior change interventions along with the cash transfer. Um, so those tend to have a bit more evidence behind them that they can actually reduce violence. So just an example, this was using village, uh, village savings and loans groups, VSLAs, um, worked specifically with female VSLA members and then their male partners. Um, it had gender dialogue groups that were aimed at helping men and women to discuss norms and attitudes around financial decisions, um, making sure that women are valued in the household, um, and the use of violence, um, and it had good evaluative um, effects on the reduce of reducing violence within that program. Um, another example, quickly, is thinking about focusing on adolescent girls. Um, again, thinking back to our gender analysis, the importance of age, what we often find is that women and girls' risk of violence changes throughout their life. Also, what types of violence they're most at risk for can change. We often find that adolescent girls are high, particularly a high risk for experiencing violence because they have intersecting um, risk factors. Um, they have less power because of their age as well as their sex. So really focusing on these, um, this population is of increasing importance in the humanitarian community. 
Also, because of the way the humanitarian community is structured, we have the child protection subsector and the GBV subsector, and sort of adolescent girls are kind of at the intersection of both and can sometimes be missed. So some programs, Erin uh, is an example of the Girl Shine program, um, again, was another IRC one, um, but looked at things like building life skills, empowerment, having safe spaces. Um, we've had evaluations of, of that this program and other similar programs in many different contexts, um, which in general we find that can improve the quality of life um, and some outcomes for girls, such as self-esteem. But oftentimes, again, we have less evidence that they affect actual rates of violence. And again, this is oftentimes because if a program is just focusing on adolescent girls, it can have limited impact because we're not actually also focusing on the perpetrators. So great for the toolbox important, really important to have adolescent girls focused programming, but probably not the silver bullet for all response. Um, another example that had a bit of better results was the Girl Empower program. Um, which was very similar to the Girl Shine model, but also had a conditional cash transfer paid to the families um, if they participated in girls groups. Um, and this looked at um, the evaluation found that it actually reduced rates of child marriage, increased condom use, um, had improved attitudes. Um, but again, sexual violence did not reduce. Um, and there was some small increase in some potential negative consequences, such as non-consensual sexual touching. So again, I don't have the silver bullet for you on like what the best prevention programming is, but there are aspects of all of these programs that do have impact and have good evidence. But oftentimes, unfortunately, what we know is that preventing violence is quite complex. And a lot of these programs might be needed um, in order to make long-term change. So then just finally, as we're moving into our, our phases of an emergency, I wanted to have one slide at the end here thinking about the post-conflict phase. So post-conflict, you know, is really an, an interesting place for us to be thinking about GBV prevention. Um, oftentimes, it's actually a really, you know, good space for us to be moving away from thinking about these individual programs to be thinking about that wider policy response. Um, there's often like a, a lot of space to actually talk about these issues um, and to support the women's movements that have been built up under a, an emergency situation to continue their advocacy and actually make change. Um, I highlight, you know, uh, examples in Liberia and Sierra Leone after the emergencies ended in those countries, um, they were really able to make a lot of efforts to for, on advocacy, on um, changing legislation, um, and really sort of built upon some of the, the women's groups and the women's movement that was built up during the conflict phase um, and were able to actually achieve real outcomes. So the post-conflict setting is also a really important point for us to be considering what we can do around GBV prevention and our work certainly does not stop when the conflict ends. Also, it's really important to be thinking about breaking that cycle of violence. Um, so particularly thinking about how we're reintegrating combatants back into societies, um, how we're doing it in a way where women are um, who were potentially associated with armed groups are able to reintegrate um, and male combatants are able to you know, get any support that they need um, and sort of reduce their use of violence as they're reintegrating back into society. There's really not a lot of evidence, unfortunately, on any of these topics from a rigorous sort of uh, mindset. There's some qualitative data out there, um, some kind of case studies, but we really don't have a lot of particular best practice that can really guide our work here. Um, so it's an important place for, for more research and effort. So uh, let's our last and final poll, and then I think I have one more slide before we open it up for discussion. So let's open our, our last poll for us here. And again, 30 seconds. So uh, just a knowledge check in general, GBV prevention, prevention programming should engage which groups? So we got 30 seconds here. 
Okay, Johanna, do you want to? Both, exactly, right? So definitely men are important. So I'm glad the 2% who, who thought that, I totally hear what you're saying. And yes, we absolutely should not leave men behind. They are essential. But really, we want to be engaging all, both men and women within the community, because it's really important that we consider um, both perpetrators, but also ensure our interventions are accountable to women and girls. So just my final takeaways, I know I've gone through a lot in this session, uh, probably talked too fast for many of you, and I apologize for that, um, but there's just so much in this space, um, and really, I really wanted to share as much as I can. We will be sharing the slides after, and of course, I think the recording will be available, so you can go back and you can, can learn more about any of these topics. Um, I just wanted to give everyone kind of a taste of the process and the space um, in humanity humanitarian action. But some of our final kind of concluding thoughts, um, aid workers, you know, we impact GBV risk, and we have a responsibility to consider how our interventions can be designed both to empower and to protect. Um, so that's essential to our jobs, um, no matter if you're a GBV specialist or not short-term risk mitigation um, approaches are essential. Again, sometimes you feel like, oh, this, this is just logic. Like we should have a lock on the latrine, like this or a light, a light would be good. Um, but they're really important and they actually do impact um, people's feelings of safety and their actual safety. So ensuring that we are doing that, um, ensuring that we're using participatory approaches. Again, you know, this is an opportunity not just to reduce risks, but to empower women and girls. Um, and using participatory approaches allows us to collaboratively identify um, and craft uh, mitigation approaches that are culturally uh, appropriate, that take into account the real um, needs of women and girls. Uh, as we all know, and I, you guys have all answered, that GBV risk mitigation is the responsibility of all humanitarian actors. Um, and GBV prevention activities can be effective in protracted crisis, long-term displacement, and post-conflict settings. So while we don't have a completely perfect answer about what the best prevention approach is, there are a lot of approaches that are suggesting that they can lead to improvements on some outcomes, um, but particularly those that engage both men and women holistically. And it's just important to consider gender and power throughout program design, monitoring, and evaluation. So with that, that was my whirlwind tour of uh, GBV prevention and response in humanitarian settings. So I think we're going to open it for Q&A. Thank you so much, Maureen, for this very comprehensive and, um, and detailed um, presentation. I, I think we all agree that we have learned so much. There's so much information to digest, and I'm so glad that there's so many questions popping out, and we're trying to address them as many as we can. Um, and then and I'm, I'm very glad that you also provide detailed example of concrete programs with some evidence of what works and what doesn't work um, to prevent violence. And it's so uh, wonderful to see these three different stages outline quite clearly what can be done uh, during in the longer term one and also post uh, conflict. Um, setting. So maybe uh, I, I, we can go through some questions together. We have about, about more than 15 minutes left and I'm glad to still maintain almost 190 participants with us until now. Um, let me try to sum, uh, sum up some of the questions together. Um, Maureen, uh, there are a few questions around how to ensure that prevention work uh, in humanitarian setting, it's accountable to women and girls, and how to engage with local women's rights organization or women-led organization in, uh, in, in the local setting to ensure that GBV is not even further perpetrated. Um, and also there's a question so in relation to that, um, how do we engage with um, with marginalized group, for example, people living with uh, HIV, people living with disability uh, in, in the prevention work. So can you speak to that? And I'll come back to another set of questions. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, the accountability issue is so huge. Um, I think the best way to make sure that our programming is accountable to women's rights organizations and um, also other marginalized groups organizations, sort of moving to that second question, is by giving them money <laughs> and actually having them engaged in the project, um, you know, whether and in a leadership position of the project. Um, Again, sort of bringing back to one of the points that I sort of spoke about in the beginning, when we're GBV prevention is a very sensitive subject in all of these contexts. Um, it's a sensitive subject in the United States. And it's really important that all the efforts are led by women's rights organizations, by local organizations, um, and that they have leadership positions throughout. So wherever possible, um, ensuring that they're actually getting funding is essential. Um, we also see different um, places like having, you know, actual like advisory groups um, where we can bring in other uh, uh, actors or different women's rights organizations. If we, we know we only have one main partner, but we want to bring in the perspectives of many where you can bring them together and have them um, advise and ensure that all of our programming is ethical, is safe, is really addressing the culture, is really addressing the actual needs, um, bringing men and women together um, in a safe place where people can talk and, and actually bring out some of these issues in a place that feels neutral um, and supportive can be a way. Um, looking at uh, marginalized groups, I would say it's very very similar. We've worked recently with a really interesting program in Haiti that was looking at this exact issue. Um, and they actually paid, you know, they had they first off had local disabilities groups as key partners in the project, designing and leading the project. But they also actually had a specific disabilities accountability specialist that they hired to say, I will represent this group um, my, through my expertise and I will check every document. I will make sure that, you know, all of the materials that we are creating are applicable for all of the different types of disabilities. Um, and so it's really, it's building those partnerships and building those, you know, accountability mechanisms through having these groups engaged and not just engaged um, with like kind of a lip service role, but actually having power in the relationship, which is, is so essential. Thank you, Maureen. Um, so the second said, there's so many, so I'm trying my best to summarize. Um, one uh, is how do we engage with government, especially when crises happen, there's a certain change of government structures, um, and how do we engage with government and government institutions to, to prevent violence throughout these, these different stages of of crisis and post-crisis, that's one. Secondly, um, it's a very difficult conversation is around the prevention of violence against men and boys during conflict, which is which, uh, which, which uh, we can see from the literatures, but that I can you speak to that in terms of uh, how to address that in, 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 in connection with uh, preventing violence against women and girls. And thirdly, can you elaborate more on um, the linkages between prevention in humanitarian setting and response and the availability of services in humanitarian setting? Because one of the questions was about how we uh, prevent violence in displaced uh, population when shelters and service and, and health services are, are not available. Yeah, over to you. Really excellent questions. Um, so starting with government, um, yeah, I think it's always a challenge. Um, I think on a very practical level, you know, it's finding our allies. You know, obviously there's oftentimes a ministry of gender and they're always usually an important ally that we can use and can be used to influence other departments. Um, but also to be frank, usually the ministry of gender doesn't have a lot of power or influence or money compared to the rest of governmental functions. So it's important to engage them and to work with them, but not to limit ourselves um, and to be thinking about how we can influence others. Um, health is a great one that we often try to work with because violence against women and girls is a public health issue um, and it's important. 
education, you know, violence in schools is a huge issue. Working with the Ministry of Education to try to ensure that this is highlighted. You know, thinking about um, there's now huge evidence around um, the costs of gender-based violence and how the prevalence of GBV can actually reduce the country's gross domestic product. So having arguments that are actually meaningful to policymakers. You know, if you're talking about economic development and you're saying like all of this money going towards, you know, um, the, the days of missed work, you know, the amount of money spent on healthcare, the amount of, you know, long-term trauma that affects people's functionality, all of these are affecting, you know, our society. And it's not just something the ministry of gender needs to take into account. Um, so it's finding allies, really trying to think about what messaging will actually affect policymakers and not really trying to appeal to their good nature. Like, let's let's be frank, right? People have their own agendas. They're trying to make their own sort of uh, advances, uh, whether they're in their personal career or with their trying to build up their society. So thinking about what angles um, fit best for them. And then, of course, there's also, again, a huge body of international norms um, around the UN Human Se or Security Council resolutions about the international human rights treaties, about all of the sustainable development goals, all of these things that we are as an international society committing to do. So, you know, also trying to link these activities um, and, and try to make sure that we're all sort of moving towards them. So I don't have the perfect solution, but hopefully some of those are helpful. Um, thinking about violence against men and boys, definitely it's an issue. Um, and I uh, is always one that we, you know, get this question about, um, because particularly in humanitarian crisis, there are certainly certain circumstances where men and boys can be particularly at risk. We think of conflict-related sexual violence, you know, oftentimes, you know, men and boys are the ones that are out on the battlefields, um, they're in barracks, they're now being, you know, recruited into formal or informal armed groups, particularly thinking about young boys going into these circumstances, you know, they are really at, certainly at risk for potential uh, sexual violence that's occurring. Um, so definitely, this is an area, I feel like, it's important to always recognize that the vast majority of uh, survivors of violence are women and girls. Um, when we look at evidence that we do have and we're recognizing that it's likely to be underreported, but also recognizing that both men and women have um, reasons to underreport this data. So if we look at, we did a study in South Sudan um, where it was about, uh, off the top of my head, I think it was about 29% of women, 25, 25 to 30%, somewhere in there, of women and girls that had experienced sexual violence. And it was about six to 9% of men and boys. Um, and that includes multiple forms of sexual violence, um, not just rape. So, you know, not nothing for men and boys, but certainly less than women and girls. So it's first off, it's just important to recognize that there is a reason why a lot of the attention um, and money and support go to women and girls. It's because they are the vast majority of um, victims in this space. However, again, if we just look at South Sudan, six to nine percent is not nothing. That is still a large percentage. So I think a lot of, of effort kind of needs to be done to be thinking about what we can do with this space that still allows for women-only spaces, that still allow for women and girls to get the support that they need. We often find that um, male programs are maybe more focused on health, but also having things like, you know, male survivors groups and thinking about male psychosocial needs, thinking about uh, ensuring that this is included in our DDR programs as male combatants are, are coming out of uh, our armed groups, having whether explicit or implicit ways for them to talk about some of the things that happened to them during conflict and get support. And I think that that's more thinking about that post-conflict stage 
outrage about reducing the cycle of violence, we know that men who've experienced violence are often more likely to perpetrate it. So it's really important that we think about ways, we think about mental health. Mental health is grossly under-resourced in humanitarian crisis. Um, and it's a huge, huge, huge need. I think of, of anything, <laughs> like that's the one where we're really thinking about it um, is really important. So, so there's that, and I'm sorry, I've now forgotten the third question. Can you repeat it for me? <laughs> um, I think that that question is linking to um, prevention and yes, connection to services and yes. response. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so yes, so response is a precursor to good prevention work. Um, and it's a challenge, um, quite honestly, because there's not always good services. Um, and there are ways that you can do um, GBV prevention work, even if response services are not there, but you have to be very, very careful. You really cannot touch a lot of the specific issues around gender norms and gender power, because once you start trying to prod those, what we often find is that sometimes there can be an increase in violence as there's a backlash against women and girls when, when those norms start to change. And so you kind of actually really do need to have response services. So I I would say, you know, in an emergency situation, you know, our goal is always to have response services and risk mitigation up. Um, and then in our longer term uh, situations, that's often where we find maybe some of those services are no longer being funded or are not as functional as they once were. Um, and really a precursor for you if you're thinking about prevention is thinking about how can we get some of those response services funded? How can, can we do a sub-grant? Can we do a partnership? Like we do really need some of these actual response services in place um, in order for us to really start doing effective prevention programming because there's really always that risk that there is going to be some kind of backlash and you really do need to be able to refer women and girls um, and men and boys such um, if needed um, to services. Thank you Maureen and uh, we, we have only four minutes left but maybe the, the last set of, 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 com, of questions and I think maybe you can definitely address quickly. Um, are there evaluations of prevention intervention in protected setting after implementation period, let's say a year later? And secondly, um, is there any evidence around the role of coordination of different prevention interventions or strategy in humanitarian setting? Great. So the first answer is very short. No, not that I'm aware of. I have not seen any kind of follow-up. I mean, honestly, we're at the stage where we're just getting that like first round of like data. And even that, like, you know, for prevention programming, not everyone's even measuring, you know, if it's really reducing violence or not. Um, it's still something, because it is challenging to collect this data in a humanitarian crisis. So we're often still relying even on proxy measures of norms and attitudes um, to sort of show that we have effectiveness. Um, so rigorous evidence around this is, is light, um, certainly even in the immediate term, uh, plus the long term. And then evidence on coordination. Um, you know, it's actually super interesting. Obviously, the GBV working groups or subclusters, depending on the settings, are there. Um, and really, they play this role. Um, I haven't seen too much of rigorous evidence looking at their effectiveness. I think that there was something after Super Typhoon Yolanda in the Philippines. Um, but it was very much, you know, a kind of desk review, sort of, you know, talking to people, sort of. Um, evaluation. It wasn't maybe, I mean, it's hard to do an impact evaluation on that kind of a thing. Um, but I do think it's really important. Um, we have such limited resources when it comes to GBV programming and coordination is such an essential component um, of this work. Um, but I don't, to my knowledge, know much about rigorous evidence uh, relating to, to its impact. Thank you so much, Maureen. So, uh, mm. Any last, last word for our participants before we close? No, I just want to say thank you all for, for being here um, and hopefully learning something that was really enjoyable for me. Um, but as you can see, we really it, we have a, lot, a great start, um, but there's still so much to learn and there's still so much room for innovation um, within this space. So we look forward to, to seeing you on this journey. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Maureen. And, and definitely this is only a 90 minute talk and it, it, we, we intend it to be introductory conversation to the topic. Definitely we cannot go so deep because the this issue and the topic is so complex, but hopefully there would, this is open the conversation to more, more discussions around this and sharing knowledge on, on how to do prevention well in different setting, including humanitarian setting. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for spending the time. I just would like to take the opportunity to, to announce that we have three um, uh, webinar left in the series. If, if Johanna can share the, um, the, the upcoming webinar. So we just did the intersection with, between violence against women and violence against children last week. And today with you, uh, Maureen, on prevention of violence against women in humanitarian context. In March, we would do an, uh, uh, a webinar on social norm change, which you mentioned uh, in your presentations. Um, so it would be great to understand how, so not, how to change, shift social norms uh, as a strategy to prevent violence. We will sp specifically look at how to engage men and boys, the, the, the question that came up today and in your conversations, how to work with men and boys in, in prevention field. And lastly, um, we would talk at the, end, uh, the, the last topic for the webinar in, in, the, in the end of March is around the social protections mechanism and, 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 and instruments for violence prevention. So hopefully uh, our participants can, can continue to join us. Again, thank you, Ma Maureen. I uh, uh, hope you enjoy the conversation with us and uh, uh, looking forward to speaking with you and learning from you in another uh, occasion.